I think that we are live. Oh, perfect. Well, I know. Bye. You keep saying that Scottsdale is better than Nashville, but you keep coming back to Nashville. So <laughs> I, I do. That. I do like it. First of all, like the fact that the airport is so close to the office. Yeah. And so there's look that that's awesome. Like because from when when I land and it's just a very short Uber ride, although Uber has gotten a lot more expensive. True. Okay. Yes. Just to be clear, that's an inflation. Is that in your inflation? Is that need to talk? We need to. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, the, it's a very short ride, which is great. But then the thing that puts Nashville over the top for me is there's this really great gym right opposite the hotel. Ooh. And I woke up this morning. I had my drink ready. I was all ready to go, and it closed. Oh my god! The gym closed, and I. So I am all out of sorts. Oh, okay. uh, the whole thing. So, Nashville is just the whole thing is just all up in the air. So is this your last trip to Nashville? I think that's what I'm saying. Oh my god! I think that's that hurts. It's not that true. Really hurts. It's not true. You'd rather have that gym. Versus don't, don't make me, me choose. the office that you get to meet. I'm saying don't make me choose. <laughs> Just don't. um. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. Happy uh uh. You know, again, first quarter market outlook, everyone. I'm sorry we're a a little bit late. Um, normal. It's usually about a week later. I would like to do it a week early if we can. Yeah. We will next quarter. Speaking of next quarter. Speaking of May first, Bhavna, we have a little announcement. Just a very tiny one. You that know, everyone already can... knows, but we should we should talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. So what's the big so what's announcement? oh I'm gonna okay. Uh so as of May 1st, just this uh, you know, we we sent emails out and we've spoken to uh, just about everybody that we could. So we are uh, we're growing. So there's a really significant acquisition uh in merger that's coming together where Inner Ocean is joining forces with Colony. And we go from a meager seven billion dollar or so asset management firm to about forty two billion dollars uh, in a couple of days, which is wonderful. It's great. It's exciting. And as we're bringing these companies together, there's a lot that we're doing with the executive management leadership as we're actively working on creating a new website and just you know making sure that all the mission values, virtues, and asset management, styles yeah. and techniques and strategies we use is all integrated successfully on one website there's a lot to be done i know i'm very excited about it just because while a lot of things aren't going to stay the same there's a lot many more new things that we would be able to yes. do and i'm super excited about that but just yeah. i mean i love the fact that you know our relationship with schwab is staying the same mm -hmm. um you know our inter oceans core strategies stay the same so yeah. we're able to offer all those good uh products and services good to the, the client yeah oh. <laughs> um and our team structures are staying the same so you know we'll continue to service our clients right. like we are but hopefully able to offer mm -hmm. you know a much wider set of additional services that i'm super excited about um and we are all looking forward to may 1st there's a lot going on this week yeah. behind the scenes in terms of you know the the tech and all the other fun integration processes mm -hmm. uh, but i'm excited to kind of see the other side of it yeah. and be able to as you said be bigger and be able to offer more for our clients yeah there was like there's a client that we're instantly we started offering bill pay services to that one that you and i are working yeah so i mean things like that there's so many things to cover we just as bobna said we're all you know we're very excited i, I but people are excited for us to get going I, I, yes okay. and maybe yes. maybe this uh out uh, capital market outlooks next quarter would look and feel a little different i can definitely see the presentation would be a little different so i'm also very excited about what the new look i'm thinking might be. two or two or three hours <laughs> is my goal i want to do it in, okay now but let's, let's dive in all right all right let me share the screen let's dive in and um and, and take a look at uh what's going on with the the market the world around us and gosh what we see what we like what we're nervous about what, what's working what's not working we've got all of these mind you just just always if you do want the slide deck i'm certainly happy to make sure that you get a copy emailed out just email anyone at your contacts at inner ocean me bhavna or whomever else it might be and we'll get this out to you right away um okay so first things first it was a Wonderful start to the year, but it seemed like it was a continuation of the 2023 theme, which was, wow, uh, up here, what a wonderful rally in, uh, you know, that large cap growth, the, the tech sector. It's, you know, you look at the Magnificent Seven down here. It's, it's again, the Apple, the Netflix, all the names are right here, by the way. Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, NVIDIA, uh, Facebook, and then Tesla, although Tesla was a 
bit of a disaster in the first quarter. Yeah, it almost lost its magnificent seven status, but it's uh, yeah. uh, if you look at it today, it's probably clinching back to it. It's, you know, I think that, and so, and we're looking at that right now, and I've had some conversations about potentially even looking to add some, because it has gone down. It was down about 40% or so in that first quarter. But but beyond that, what, what I want to contextualize is this kind of continued difference between the return of that U.S. big blue chip, large cap, th those kind of companies versus the small U.S. companies, which you're just not seeing the earnings power, you're not seeing the like that the re reward for multiple valuation. You're just not seeing that. Uh, and of course, there's the bond performance on bottom, which has been just absolutely abysmal. No yeah. reward for the bond investors, yeah. no reward for those conservative holdings. Um, and it's just it, it has just been a long stretch of time where big blue U.S. growth based companies have had better balance sheets, better pricing power, better margins. And one begins to ask, like, well, is this just the way it's going to be? Yeah. Is yeah. this just what we're going to be dealing with? Although I would say there was a little bit of a break from that. Again, I completely agree that fourth quarter was just a continuation of it might as well be in the fifth quarter of yeah. 2023 really for all was. practical purposes. We did see a little bit of a, a, you know, deviating from that mega trend, especially in the month of April. Yes. Uh, you know, obviously we've seen a little bit of a volatility kind of picking up in the market, the returns after we were getting so used to every month being exactly like this yeah. over the last 15, 16 months. And April was a little bit of a deviation from that. And we'll talk about that a lot more. For example, you know, from the end of March to let's say about April 19th, the S&P was down roughly about five and a half. half percent. You gave half the um, back in it. We're clinching yeah. back to the trend again with the earning seasons kind of unwinding. And, mm -hmm. you know, there are quite a lot of companies that have already reported uh, earnings. Uh, generally, it's mm. been a good earning season so far. We've seen yeah. quite a lot of uh, top line and bottom line beats, mm -hmm. which is which is always encouraging to see and something that the market really needs to keep justifying the, the valuation yes. multiples that it's trading at. Um, so we have a lot more on that coming up uh, on the next set of slides as I'm we go sorry. through the deck. I, I, want, I wanted to see if I could get the other. Okay, yes, I agree. Yes. So with regards to that, I just in, in a way to like numerically just just uh, can't just be able to explain how wide the dispersion of returns have been from large to small to international. The best way we can put it is you put a million dollars in. So just here, this is the classic S&P 500, the 500 largest. It just has tended to be growth weighted that index. Here's your three-year cumulative return, your five. Here's your 20-year. This outperformance is not just something that we've seen, Bhavna, over yeah. the past six months or the past year or two. It's been a long couple of decades cycle. And look at your international investments. Mm -hmm. Now, 1 million to 3 million, at least it's a 300% return over 20 years, but it pales in comparison to what, what it would be like for the S&P 500. The small, the small cap, but again, look at the dispersion, the difference between those long-term returns in these parts of the market. So it's yeah. it's notable. Yeah, and, and the length of that overperformance mm -hmm. now extending, be, you know, over 20 years has started yes. to defy a lot of explanation as to like, yes. it, it's not a, you know, it's not a short-term trend. It's not, uh, it's also deviated away from the historical trends of like, you know, there's a little bit of a back and forth between whether U.S. capital markets dominate the, the global markets or the international. And there's usually a little bit of a back and forth. Right. But this is completely different phenomena. Like, how do you justify a 20 years of overperformance? So the, what I believe to be true, and again, I think there's I think there's a number of factors. As I mentioned, I think that the quality of the balance sheets, the quality of the earnings, truly those big balance sheet companies have more control over their financial destinies more so than the others i think that the other i think that the other um the other instance that i want to highlight is that um not, not only is it a balance sheet issue um but it is a um um uh i, I, I lost my train of thought that's okay I mean, I would say a couple of things to highlight is, again, uh, for the international markets, especially the developed markets, you know, their um, 
more immediate effect of all the war and the geopolitical concerns going on in the yes. background definitely weighs heavier on them versus the US. And in the emerging market segment, you know, China's growth, not yes. you know, keeping up with what the expectations were, uh, <laughs> is also the reason why emerging markets haven't been at the top of this chart. The other thing, this is the other one, and I'm sure that this is right, lack of M&A. So M&A mergers and acquisitions, normally what would happen is that big companies would acquire small companies so that they can add new lines of business to continue their profitability. But we've seen a lot less of that. The government is, you know, frankly, has been less willing to let these big companies continue to grow bigger via acquisition. Mm -hmm. So you're not seeing some of those small companies get that explosive upside performance as they're developing new technologies. The big companies are absorbing them. We're just not seeing it. Mm -hmm. So I know that's another component, a lack of M&A. And mm -hmm. maybe, uh, again, if as we see M&A activity start to increase, we'll see the small small stocks perform. That's a good point. Oh, I know. Yeah. I know. I knew it was, I had to think, I was like, what happened? It was such a the perfect thought. Okay. So, um, but again, so one of the things that we would look at as we're looking at market volatility, particularly in April, clients are like, okay, so we've given up half of the upside. What should I do? One of the key indicators that you would look at is you'd look at volatility and mm -hmm. you'd say, you know, if you're getting to these kind of peak areas of volatility, this goes back to 2022, this chart. If you're looking at the peak volatility, you'd say, well, geez, these are there's something signaling where there's where there's real market uh, switching of momentum. Uh, this is where we reached at one point, 19.2. But you can look on a even a short term historical context. Volatility is nowhere near a level of concern. It's nowhere near a level where you'd say, wow, uh, I need to take a step back. I need to get out of the market. Let me get out of the way. I'm just not. So I don't view volatility uh, which which has increased some from certainly from where we had been uh, as any you know cause for alarm. Um, here we are with GDP. Now the GDP forecast is is that first uh, element where you say, well, geez, the market's down some, given up some. Is as the momentum switched? Is there anything that we need to look at? Mm -hmm. And here you go. Here's your first piece. Um, GDP uh, earnings estimates uh, uh, for the for the U.S. economy came out. We were expecting 2.3, came in 1.6. That is a big miss. It is. That's a huge miss. And it's like, well, okay. So is this is this a real cause for concern? Is is all of this thought like, man, the U.S. economy is on a runaway train? It's great. We had these huge third quarter and fourth quarter numbers. You know, massive GDP growth and. This is where you start to say, well, hold, hold on a second, because people say, well, we still have high inflation, which I don't want to steal your thunder. I know you're going to go into inflation. We still have high inflation. And yet at the same point, we're seeing growth start to really moderate here. So remember, when we do these market outlooks, they are designed to take a look at the data and we're interpreting the data to give us indications if the market and the economy are overvalued, fairly valued, undervalued, somewhere in between. This is one of the data points that we're looking at, and it just says, hmm, this is like some, some, something for us to look out for. Yeah, and it, this also could be the, you know, the kind of the turning, it already is, you know, the, the narrative is shifting from what it was yeah. uh, back in December, when there was a lot more excitement about that we ended 2023 no recession in sight yes. everything is looking great pretty strong mm -hmm. and that's why the original forecast for the fourth quarter and the first quarter gdp estimates were pretty strong yep. uh, and that was just completely uh you know overriding the fact that there is any recession concerns right. uh, lingering around with this recent print that kind of shifts the narrative mm -hmm. back to what we were talking about around this time back in 2023 saying is this going to be a recession year, et cetera, et cetera. And again, right. you're nowhere close to that point. Yeah. It's still 1.6% GDP growth is still a good number. Mm -hmm. It just is a pretty wide gap from what was expected. And it's kind of pushing the narrative in the other direction, right. saying we have things to work through. It's mm -hmm. not going to be a smooth sailing from here. Yes, but and everyone wants to take this as, well, what is the Fed going to do? What is Correct. it? We're going to talk about the Fed. Absolutely. We're going to talk about the Fed. We got a lot to talk about. So, um, so this chart, we, you know, Bhavna and I talked about whether or not we should even have it in there. But he, here's what I here's what I want to portray. Here's what I here's the information I want to make sure you guys all have because I want to give you 
the keys and indicators that we're looking at, not just GDP, we're going to look at all the different data sets that we look at to give indications about where the market and the economy are going so that you have a greater understanding of how we look at things and how we end up making decisions. So it's interesting. The note, I think, is where I'm going to start. Uh, almost every recession since 71, and I know people can read this, I know, um, was caused by oil, oil shock prices. Again, you have oil going up, recession. You've got oil going up, recession. You've got oil going up, no recession. Oil coming down, this is kind of like the, the uh, late 80s. This is you know the stock market crashing. Um, oil going up, recession. You have these these kind of spikes and, and, and it's obvious. And I know we talked about why it's obvious, but when the price of oil goes up, a few things obviously happen. Um, we have consumers that must spend more to fill up their tanks. And that's, that is a something that hurts consumer spending. You've got businesses that have to transport goods and make goods. And when the price of energy goes up, the price to construct and to distribute things go up, that ends up hurting profits. So I get all of that. Here's what I want to illustrate is that we're aware of this. This is kind of the, the latest data point for where right. the price of oil is. And um, what I would tell you is that the conflict in the Middle East, depending upon where it goes, will end up being a partic particularly large, uh, potentially negative impact center for the price of oil. And then secondarily, let's not forget, Bhavna, that we've got the big summer driving season that we're headed into. Mm -hmm. So when you got summer driving season where oil demand rises, you got a little bit of conflict in the Middle East. You say you, you could start to you could start to put this story together, and right now it is just a story that, wow, um, you know maybe the price of oil goes up, and that and that is that what triggers a, a surprise recession? Because you got the, the GDP numbers are looking a little weaker, and then you put in the price of oil rising, you're like wow, and you could start to see like oh maybe this is how it unwinds. Um, uh, again, we are watching it. Oil oil has come down a little bit as Middle East tensions have subsided right. some. We're, we're watching it. We'll continue to watch it. And um, as that changes, we will, um, yeah, as it changes, we will, you know, we'll let you know. Absolutely. And I All right. So where was I? Oil. Oil's high. Yes. <laughs> Oil's high. Is it going to cause a recession? I don't. I don't yet know. But we are watching. Um, we are going to, and we are actively watching the the oil markets, the the trouble in the Middle East, because that could be something that rises oil prices, hurts consumer spending, hurts business spending in turn. If nothing else, I think what that chart also reminds us is that our journey back to the target inflation rate is, mm -hmm. might be just a little longer than what was originally anticipated. We are going to talk uh, about that. That's just one another, uh, you know, another factor to consider saying, you know, we're not going to get there in a couple of months. That's right. Right. That's um, right. And you need to have a little more patience before we get to that target. You may, you will need all the patience you can, you can make happen. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and dive into economic expectations, Bob. Nah, let's um, do it. And there's a lot of charts in this segment, but again, a quick side note. I, I know that a lot of charts and data points that we present uh, in these webinars are not always aligned and are saying the exact same thing and that's kind of the point like we want to look at all the different the conflicting the data is going to be perfect uh, no no perfect. and again it's we're not trying to weave in a story that just blends in perfectly we are intentionally right. trying to show you a lot of different charts and data points that kind of are contradictory in a lot of ways that's right uh, and that i would say uh, is also the theme for this section there are uh, a lot of charts and data points in this section where in the I guess the, the key uh, theme here is that the, the the economic indicators are strong but waning and we will see pockets of that strength yeah. and that weakness along the way when we go through these, these slides. For example, the slide that we have right now in front of us is talking about the ISM manufacturing and non-manufacturing index mm -hmm. that usually is a leading indicator of whether there is, whether the, there is growth in economic activity or contractions. And obviously, uh, you know, a reading above 50, for instance, shows you growth and the reading below 50 shows that there's contracting activities. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've, we've been doing okay 
uh, on those indicators. The most recent readings are actually above 50, so it's still showing growth, which kind of lines back to the GDP growth numbers that we've seen on the previous slides. Um, the economic surprise index is nothing but just a gauge of whether these different economic indicators that are coming out mm -hmm. uh, are higher than expectations or lower than that also kind of gives you a reference point that if these prints are higher than expected, there is obviously a little bit of a positive news kind of hidden uh, exactly. across the board. By the way, manufacturing is still in a recession. I mean, it's a, it's, it's improving. It's, it's improving. Yeah. It's kind of it's right at the cusp. So, but the services, obviously, you know, non-manufacturing is really being the strong point that would also stand out in the inflation section. Mm -hmm. Your services is what is still driving a lot of that inflation. And, and people who regularly listen, and we know you regularly listen to this, is that you'll know that services is a much larger part of our economy than manufacturing. Mm -hmm. That's still worth noting. Yeah. Okay. Look at the job market. Again, a lot of positive news, which can also be interpreted as bad news, depending on what you're trying to solve right. for. For example, you know, we still have more job job openings than unemployed, uh, unemployed people. Yeah. It isn't as high as what we were seeing in the recent past, but a 1.4 is still a pretty strong number. There are yep. more jobs out there than people looking for it, which is, mm -hmm. you know, which tells you how strong the job market is. It's really, look at this trend. Yeah, it's been, it's it's been a pretty fascinating uh, journey. I, I chose a highlighter now, so now I feel like I need to use it. Okay, uh, sorry. Wage growth, again, another pretty solid data point. Uh, the most recent reading, the March 2024, was a 4.7% yeah. three-month moving average. That's a pretty solid number. Mm -hmm. And again, just to put it in reference, a peak that you see all towards the end was around June, July, August of 2022. We were looking at 6.7% type of uh, yep. readings. Mm -hmm. So we've seen a little bit of a slowdown in that wage growth, but it's still pretty strong. Look at all the historic right. reference Wage points. is still growing, just less quickly. Just less quickly. But Bhavna, come on. Wage growth going down, wage growth going down, wage growth going down, recession, recession, recession. So again, you know. I'm just saying. Right. Again, there are yeah. a lot of uh, data points that are kind of indicating in that direction. But again, we spent almost all of 2023 talking about yeah. recession possibilities too. And I also would indicate that when you, these things really need to hit some kind of like a bottom level. We're no, like, this we're is no still a lot of wage. Yeah, no, Correct. you'd have to be somewhere down in that range. So Correct. we're aware. I see it. I see it. Uh, moving on and looking at the business and consumer confidence. Yeah. Again, a lot of interesting trends here. Michael, do you want to talk a little more about some of the? Yes. So business spending is a component of, uh, of course, our overall GDP. It's about 20% or so. Uh, figure 70% or so is U.S. consumer spending and the remaining 10% or so is government spending. That will keep that in mind because that will come back. That'll be handy for you later. Um, listen, so we're still seeing a little bit of growth here, positive, but the trend for, um, you know, business expenses, small business expenses is not positive. And if you're looking at, you know, consumer optimism, what are we seeing like this kind of massive positive trend? Yes, we're coming off, off the bottoms, but the general trend has been a little bit softer, which I think speaks to the general over, um, overall um, viewpoint or mood of consumers in the economy. It's a little bit more, a little bit more gloomy. So consumers looking a little bit more gloomy. Small business, small businesses, we're seeing a little bit more gloom there as well. Those are we're starting to see. So parts of the economy are showing some signs of weakness. So I think that there again is that's an area where we want to just highlight and say. Much like with GDP, yeah. this is something that goes into the concern part of that equation. Mm -hmm. It is not by all means like saying, well, it's over. But yeah, no, we're, we're, we would hope that this these trends will reverse in order to indicate right. continued economic growth. Right. And then a similar uh, sentiment with the consumer spending. Mm -hmm. We've obviously, consumer spending has been strong. That's yeah. been one of the, you know, the, the kind of the silver lining yeah. uh, in the overall economic growth, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But we also know that if you move to the next slide, yeah. uh, we also know that a lot of that consumer spending is supported by the fact that the savings rate, which were obviously very, very strong during Robust. the pandemic, mm -hmm. because of a lot of that stimulus, uh, you know, mm -hmm. aid that was provided to the consumer. So the consumers are over the last couple of years kind of spending through yeah. that. So we definitely see that, you know, pretty 
dramatic decline in For the sure. savings mm -hmm. rate, yep. uh, which is also supported by the fact that the, the credit card debt is also going up. So those yeah. two components are keeping the consumer going in yeah. letting them keep spending, but eventually that will run out, mm -hmm. right? Or we'll go back to the point where consumer spending consistently is not as strong as it has been in the recent past. Exactly. Which again, kind of puts it back in that category saying, for now, we're doing good. Consumer spending looks good, but can this be the case? Whatever. I got another slide. I know you know another graph that shows cons you know uh, consumers saving and how low it is on a historic basis. It just it starts to give this feeling that even though wages are up, mm -hmm. when you see that start to weaken a little bit, it gives me the feeling that the consumer is running out of gas, running out of power, running out of steam somewhat. And it, particularly with credit card interest rates at all time record highs. Um, some of these things start to conflict a little bit. You get mortgage rates, which right. we'll talk more about mortgage rates too. We got a lot to talk about. We do. We okay. Do. Okay. All right. So let's go. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, I'm back. This is me. This is you. Okay. Uh, this is a little bit of a new segment, so to oh, say. Uh, we should have confetti. <laughs> yeah, it's new, but you know, this is, but this is the thing. Um, I, I know that everyone who's tuned in is at least aware uh, on some level or another that U.S. total indebtedness is massive. And so I, I you know, I've asked my wife, I, I asked people, I did the presentation, Market Outlook presentation last week, and say, how much indebtedness do we have as a country? And um, I'm surprised at how many people don't really know. And, and, and I, I just want to make sure that you're aware of the data so that you can start to uh, understand it and contextualize it better. So when I ask every one of you how much U.S. debt we have outstanding in total right now, I would like for people to answer about 34 trillion would be like the perfect answer. Some people I know said it was 100 trillion. That was a little off, <laughs> but uh, I'm not picking anyone out in particular. But I'm just saying, you know, we, you know, but you should, you need to know it. So here's where we were at the end of 2023. We were at $33 trillion of debt. Now that's ballooned to $34 trillion. If you go back to 2014, it was pick that time because it's a 10-year pocket of time where our total indebtedness has doubled. And the big event that really pushed the our, our debt to kind of those new levels was COVID. But but honestly, Bhavna, this 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 trend has been continuing at this rate for some time. And what that if I were to pull that back even further, you would see that we were going at a really slow controlled rate of U.S. total debt until the financial crisis. You know, we're somewhere around seven hundred, believe it or not, like seven hundred billion dollars or so of U.S. debt, which exploded quickly up to 5 trillion before you knew it, it was 10 trillion. That was all born in the financial crisis. Um, if you look at uh, the, the government spending relative to the tax receipts that come in, um, that's, uh, that's right over here. I know, I know, I know. I was good. So if you look, so just like last year alone, Bhavna, just last year alone, we spent 1.7 trillion more than we took in. We took in $1.7 trillion less taxes than we're, so that there's a few different ways to look at it saying the same thing twice. And if you look at the Biden administration budget, it's $2 trillion short of where tax revenues are expected to be. So we're continuing to see total deficit spending increase. I do want to emphasize that the us running a deficit isn't yeah. a very recent phenomenon. Like it you said, not. it's been a trend that's been kind of in play for several, yes. you know, you know, for a, for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of interesting to kind of put these numbers into perspective, saying, you know, for how long can you continue to spend more than what the sources of revenue are? Um, and still be, you know, a, run a sustainable balance sheet. The answer to that question is we're going to find out. We're going to find out together because right. it's not yet known. And, and I will tell you that if, if this chart just went a teeny little bit further back, what you would see is that after World War II, our total debt to GDP was over 100%. But what happened is, is that the government at that time really capped the, uh, the, the U.S. federal debt 
did not let it expand. And then the economy grew. And as the economy grew, the amount of debt that we were carrying seemed, seemed smaller and smaller and smaller. And the relative borrowing that the government did relative to how much the economy grew, it improved and improved and improved. It's not like the debt really went down a yeah. whole lot, but the economy grew. And you can see that really, and I've got the next slide that will hammer this point home a little bit further, just and it'll just as you said. Yeah. Um, really, it turned into a Republican and Democrat environment where both Democrats and Republicans had the same thing, spending more. It's just Republicans were tax cut and spend more, and Democrats were tax more and spend more. Correct. The commonality is spend, spend more. more. Yeah. So this continued. Uh, the one pocket of time, which you'll see on the next slide, is, uh, I don't know, it's, a, it's two slides deeper, is, is right in here. And this is kind of those dot-com days where, uh, again, we had tons of capital gains, tons of IPOs, extra, extra high tax revenues right here in this pocket. But short of that, Bhavna, decade by decade by decade, anything under that blue line is more spending than revenues coming in. Yeah. And just in the recent past, I think just this focus of spending has shifted mm -hmm. a little bit. That's the only new factor, the right. meaning, you know, instead of providing direct aid to the households, we're now, you know, putting a lot more uh, dollars towards subsidizing green energy, et cetera. So it's just different things that we are spending on. Yes. But the fact that we are spending more than we are earning as an economy kind of stays it's consistent. Exactly. And then this chart, I mean, I really like this chart because it also... Mm -hmm puts all of that in the context that, yes, it would have been okay to run a higher debt to GDP uh, mm -hmm. number for a period of time when the interest rate environment was very accommodative. Sure. And the interest sure. rates yeah. were fairly, you know, pinned down to fairly low numbers and you didn't yes. really have to shell a lot of money to keep servicing that debt. If you look at the end of this chart, uh, this is a pretty unique phenomenon. We are yes. running a really high debt to G D GDP ratio while the interest rates are, are also rising mm -hmm. fairly high in that historical context. So the last time the real and real yields, by the way, what that means is that is the interest rates minus inflation. Just so you know, it gives you a sense for an inflation adjusted real interest cost. So people say like, oh yeah, we've been here before. Yeah. Oh, look at this blue. We've been here before. But but no, no, no. Not levels. with this debt levels. Exactly. Yeah. So the debt levels, you know, really it, it's doubled relative to the size of the economy. So it is, and we very much are, are in uncharted territory. Um, here's that personal savings rate, as I mentioned. It just gives you some context of a consumer that's really starting to maybe, you know, run out of steam. Uh, we because we see the government trend um, here in light blue is the government spending continues to ramp up where, um, you know, we're seeing some household spending start to moderate a little bit and business spending has been on a pretty consistent um, trend. So point is, is that we see some really mixed data with regard to the debt and deficit spending. I just want you guys to know, A, what the size is, B, from a historical context where this becomes uh, problematic and concerning. The question that you may be asking is, when does this become a problem? Bhavna, you already mentioned it. I'm going to make sure we mention it again in conclusion, is that it's not yet known. It's not yet known because the U.S. currency still is the worldwide reserve currency. And if you look at the strength of the U.S. dollar, people continue to, to want it, to buy it, relatives right. or other currencies across the world. So until that relationship meaningfully breaks, where the U.S. Uh, currency is no longer the worldwide standard, worldwide reserve, we're going to be okay. Correct. But how long does that last right. for? And, and there really isn't anyone that knows what that tipping point might be. For. Again, quick side note, clarification of showing those, you know, trillions on, on the mm -hmm. slides is not really uh, to cause, con con you know, signs of concerns. Yeah. It's something that we need to act on on an urgent basis. The market is very aware of U.S.'s balance sheet situation mm -hmm. and the fact that we do have at least for now, some time to figure a more sustainable solution to this growing problem. I would say it is a little bit of a slow burn yep. kind of happening in the background. The market is very aware of it. Every now and then we see a little bit of new information in terms of, you know, the credit rating agencies kind of throwing uh, signals, supporting signs, supporting yeah. signs out yeah. saying, yeah. you know, we are watching. Everyone needs to watch for these. But again, it, that, it isn't something that would you know, materialize really quickly unless 
you know, a lot of other factors mm -hmm. change, such as the, the dollar reserve currency status, exactly. et cetera. So we'll keep watching it uh, in the background. It does obviously feed into other issues in the short term, but the, the, the debt levels per se are and something that we're worried about on a quarter on quarter basis. That's right. You ready to do some inflation? Let's do it. I mean, I know we've been talking about inflation, but let's do more. Who I can always go for more inflation. <laughs> No. I can never get enough inflation. No. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. That didn't sound right. I can't have this. There's such a thing as too much Careful inflation. what you wish for. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'll be quiet. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, this is you, right? Oh, no, is this me? This is me. Oh, you love inflation. I love inflation. That's what I, okay. Yeah. So inflation. So um, if you're kind of looking at the headline, the headline, Bhavna, is Oh, uh, we're, again, inflation's improving. But I know you've been listening to these podcasts and I know you've been listening to us. So yes, it has improved, but it's moderating. And if we're looking where the inflation's coming from, this is the clearest as I can make it. Service inflation still continues to be there. And service is, the reason why that's a little concerning is services is the largest part of our economy. It's not manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Second time I've mentioned that on this podcast today. Um, this is where the inflation is coming from. We're continuing to see inflation here in blue, which is the one that everyone really likes to talk about. That's the food inflation, um, where, you know, goods inflation, where again, purple, this, this was the supply shortage in purple. We don't have a supply shortage anymore. In fact, a little bit of, a little bit of goods deflation. That's I think a sign of maybe some demand weakness and energy, which was a negative. You saw the price of oil going down and energy costs going down here in gold for these quarters in 2023, starting to peak its head a little bit here in inflation. So the vast majority of inflation is service related. It's the largest part of the economy. And the, the thing I want to also connect is that even though this is moderated, what was this? Is, you have to wrap your head around this is that we had super, super high inflation. Those prices stayed intact as to where they were. And then you added more continued inflation on those higher numbers. It's not like those prices ever went down, particularly on the services or food side, but you've got, you've got now the scenario where people's grocery store um, bills are, you know, over the past two, two and a half years are 30, 40, sometimes 50% more in aggregate, just over a couple of year period of time, because it's old inflation on top of new inflation with prices not coming down. So this is why it's 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 challenging. The fact that it has not continued to moderate and go down is a little bit concerning. And this black line, I think, says it best. This is what the, one of the key and central points that the Fed looks at. This is the core inflation. Yes, you saw it peaked in early, mid-2022. You're seeing it subside, but it's really flattening out. This is not that kind of continued, you know, down to 2% number. And the reason why this is an issue is that we're trying to help forecast whether or not the Fed's going to do those interest rate cuts. The Fed, at one point, people were thinking there'd be six interest rate cuts. Right. And then like to start the year, it was, well, maybe, no, 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 maybe there'll be four. And right now, right now, depending upon who you talk to, it's maybe one or two. Or none. Or, or okay, zero, <laughs> zero, one, or two. Right. In that, in that, and it's and it's because of these inflation numbers which had which were improving. Oh, this is I'm gonna take this chart and I'm gonna just, oh, it's gonna go down to two percent. The Fed's gonna cut. Well, that hasn't happened. That hasn't happened. And this moderating thing is beginning to start to create this feeling like, could this end up being an environment like we had in the 70s where the, the, that inflation came down, the, the, the Fed did cut in the 70s, and then inflation spiked way higher, and then we had to raise interest rates up to, for those that remember, about 15% in order to really bring inflation down. So I don't think the Fed's in a rush to increase rates. They, it, it, you don't need that many history books to know we weren't there that long ago in the 70s um, that, that inflation really showed its ugly head. Mm -hmm. That second time around, and it because really what this is, and I the last note on it is this wage price inflation spiral, which is you have the cost of goods and services going up, particularly now services. As a result, you need to pay your people more because their quality of life goes down. And then as you need to pay your people more, your profits go down. So what do you need to do as a business? You need to raise prices, and 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 it just it continues, and it continues. We hear stories of 
fast food restaurants, whether it be in California or otherwise, that are increasing wages, which they do, but then that in turn leads to increases in prices at the menu, and it just continues and continues and continues. And so when you have an economy that's that's growing and expanding, it can handle that, the Fed sometimes steps in. So again, point being, the fact that core inflation is flattening out and is moderating is something we're watching very closely because um, it, it's going to give us the playbook about what the Fed's going to do. And then it's also going to give us indication of how the market's going to react or not react. So, And uh, we have seen a lot of, like you said, you know, we came from the expectations that there might be six rate cuts to now, now it is one or two or zero. So we've already, and that was one of the reasons why in the month of April, we saw a little bit of that yep. readjustment in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, Wix spiked up a little bit. We saw some negative numbers, uh, you know, uh, in terms of weekly performances for the market. So there is that readjustment yep. happening because the market is forward looking. Mm -hmm. So it is trying to realign itself saying, okay, now that we know how the year is shaping up for the corporate America in terms of earnings updates. We know what's going on with inflation. We know that we saw a little bit of a lower than expected growth in GDP. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a little bit of that reset happening. So it's been, yep. again, we've gotten used to of the markets just kind of clocking in uh, month on month increases. Yep. Uh, but it all the, the month of April also was pretty healthy in that sense that we saw a little bit of that mm -hmm. you know realignment happening. So uh, nothing that we need to be concerned about. We let the markets kind of readjust its expectations because it is important for us to have realistic expectations from the economy and from the Fed. Yeah. Um, that's right with that you know it's it's a good segue to kind of talk about the equity valuation you love equity valuation let's just be honest you love it okay go ahead um is the market expensive it it definitely is uh, you know and this is a good chart that kind of puts that into perspective in terms of looking at the s p 500s forward 12 months p ratios and where we are we're sitting at roughly around 20.5 x right now um it's it's definitely above the historic averages mm -hmm. it's also supported by the fact that we have these really high expectations from the corporate america saying mm -hmm. they just keep doing a phenomenal job at uh, growing their top and the bottom line um, and that's where a little bit of that justification for these higher multiples is but coming from. Yeah, but wait, but so let's also, but let's also just give a nod to these. There are just a few companies that are really hammering it in terms of the earnings and revenue. And it's 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 what's moving this whole thing higher, but this doesn't speak to like the whole market. It doesn't. And it goes back mm -hmm. to the very first slide that we were talking about, that yep. imbalance. Yep. Um and this this higher multiple is supported by a very very small subset of the companies in the market yeah. uh, while everyone else is still kind of playing catch up that's right uh, and kind of lagging behind and you, that actually shows up in the next slide as well next slide. It, we you know we look at the again the earnings expectations for the s p 500 um, we're seeing a little bit of a obviously an adjustment on that for for the full year we're still expecting, you know, a nine and a half, you know, 10, 11 percent type of an earnings growth. That's a, that's is, a, that's a great year. It, that, if it happens. If it happens, it would be a phenomenal year. Uh, and that can actually keep things going uh, and, yeah. you know, provide coverage to some of the weak points that we're seeing at a, a few other places. Can I highlight that? Yeah. So what I'm seeing is, though, I'm seeing revenue numbers are are like right there they're they're better but they're not like smashingly better so the top we call it the top line yeah it, it's, it's good a little bit better than expected the earnings we've had a lot of earnings beats on a historical yes. basis and then that's great but it's coming from a lot of cost cutting cost cutting that's been the theme you, you so far cut yourself forever correct and which which is also a reason of a little bit of that readjustment that we've seen in the market so far roughly about 165 companies on the s p 500 have reported earnings God, he's counting um Just... <laughs> 57 55 to 57 percent mm -hmm. of those earnings updates have seen mm -hmm. a top line growth yep. which is always something more comforting for the market yes more than 80 percent of the companies are reporting a bottom line uh, right. beat, which to your point, all of that is coming from cost cuts. We know and that's not, right. yeah. And that's not a sustainable way of keep growing your earnings. Mm -hmm. So uh, that again, 
puts a little bit of that readjustment yes. back on the market saying, uh, are we expecting too much mm-hmm. in terms of earning growth? Are we leaving no room for error here? Because it's like priced for perfection. You know, we always start the year with high expectations and I don't care if it's GDP or corporate profits and you know, as the year goes on. It's not always a bad thing. It's not. And but, we are so far kind of on that trend. Yes. Uh, that, you know, we as we progress through the year, it won't be surprising to see that there are some readjustments yep. for what the rest of the year looks like mm-hmm. in terms of earnings growth. And we may end up with a very different number yep. at the end of the year versus what yeah. was the expectations leading into Absolutely. 2024. I'd expect that. We good on this one? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's get Okay. Oh, NASDAQ. We did not move this one. We kept yeah, it here. We, we kept it here. And this was uh, just a, again, a quick reference point in terms of how, uh, you know, obviously we've seen a pretty strong rally back in the NASDAQ. Right. And, uh, you know, the question has been, is it being too strong? And so this slide does a really good job at putting that into context of, you know, how the historical especially like the last, you know, if you look at the last force market cycle moves, et cetera. Um, and that kind of paints the picture mm-hmm. that the the run-up that we've seen mm-hmm. uh, in NASDAQ recently isn't really no. out of the norm. Uh, no. in, in fact, it's probably below uh, what we've seen in the last right. four. Right, as crazy as that may seem. Right. Yeah. By the way, start with this. <laughs> I, I, I got excited with the yellow. Um, but you're right. And so, yeah, the NASDAQ rally has been great, but it hasn't been off the charts. Like, unique. We've never seen it before. People love their houses. We know if you're tuning in, we know you love your house. And this is kind of one of the ways that we can give you a quick heads up on what's going on in the housing market. What I want to make sure we contextualize is that as consumers who own homes, as their prices go up, they do more what? They do more spending. If the price of your home goes down, you end up doing less spending. It's one of those things that really helps with the mood of consumers and the mood of consumer spending. So as home prices go, sometimes as consumer confidence can go with it. So it's important that we look at it. Um, This, I want to draw your attention to the housing affordability index. We know the prices of homes have gone up. I guess I'll get to that now. We know the high prices of homes have gone up. And here are your major markets on this, in this right-hand side. Phoenix leading the way over the past 10 years, uh, 123% price appreciation. Go for it. But you look at looking around, I mean, obviously there's, there's, this has just been an amazing move higher in home prices. This is, uh, you know, this is great. Part of that is the supply because we know anything in economics is supply and demand, less supply, even if there's kind of similar demand, less supply means prices go up. But look at the number of homes sitting on the market. You may look at your own neighborhoods and say, you know, this doesn't feel like housing mayhem because it's not like everyone's buying and fixing and flipping and moving and renovating. In fact, the number of homes that are sitting on the market are about as low as we've seen in, in modern history. And it's <laughs> with more real estate agents um, um, than ever, this is eye opening. Uh, I wonder, you know, if that uh, lawsuit against the, uh, um, uh, the real estate the, yeah, the right. association yeah I don't know uh, it's pretty rough um and right now I put this as the as of last Friday the 30-year mortgage is at 7.23 the 15-year mortgage is at 6.7 so these things continue to rise we haven't seen you know this kind of seven percent you know mortgage we haven't seen that really in in you know since the year 2000 some mm-hmm. couple of decades we know that's going to have an impact on the price of housing but Higher interest rates, even though wages are up, home prices are up so much that the housing affordability index is is is, is challenged. So what we've started to also see is a supplement where institutional buyers are coming in and buying homes in a in a rate that's greater than got frankly that we've seen here in this country before. So you have institutional buying, you have home affordability that's challenged, um, mortgage applications are in the toilet. And as you're looking at how all of these things factor together, it is very suggestive of if you already own your home, the fact that your home price is up gives you great comfort. It's one of the strongest tenants of consumer confidence that you'll have. Uh, Again, if you start to see supply start to rise, you would have to assume that when supplies and if supplies rise, given how much home prices have moved forward, that there's kind of a return to normalcy. And what that would look like is is that home prices would kind of be 
in this range down here, you'd see that the markets that have grown the, much, the most would end up being the ones that would be hurt the most. You know, here we go with Dallas and Phoenix again, mm -hmm. um, um, potentially leading that charge. And I can very easily see that come, but we're not going to see it unless you see home supplies meaningfully go up. And if mortgage rates are that high, you have so many folks that are unable and unwilling to move because they've got their 3% mortgage that they're stuck in their homes. And it's a very interesting series of dynamics. But for now, home prices look stable. Ta-da! With that, let's move on quickly to the bond yes. market. There are just, a, you know, the only point I wanted to make on this slide, and we've talked, we've been talking about this over the last few uh, uh, podcasts, is that the credit spreads are tight. Very tight. Um, and what that really means, again, you see both the investment grade corporate bonds versus the treasury, as well as the high yield corporate. And that's, you know, the, it's the same thing uh, on both fronts. The credit spreads are tight. Mm -hmm. And why that really matters is if you move on to the next slide, yep. is just a reflection back on how the interest rates and bond prices kind of behave and interact with each other is the fact that um, you know obviously a longer duration so for example look at both these charts one is showing you a change in the bond price for a one percent decrease or a one percent increase yep. in the interest rates top and to bottom. Yep. it's top to bottom and what you can clearly see is that for shorter duration bonds that sensitivity and that volatility is pretty narrow while for a longer duration bond that sensitivity is pretty high so when we keep talking about the credit spreads being tight, yep. um, this kind of puts it into perspective saying that when you're not getting rewarded for taking that additional risk through either through US investment grade bonds or high yield, which is even more riskier, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't merit going into a longer duration investment because that's the segment that's most sensitive to interest rate changes. Mm -hmm. And un unfortunately, we're still kind of navigating through that uh, that that part of uh, you know the time wherein we don't really know mm -hmm. where we will settle at on those interest rates. We yes. went from a lot of rate cuts to very few rate cuts to maybe no rate cuts, uh, higher for longer. Not really like it, it, we've been like going back and forth on just this year. Just this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that environment. Uh, and we've kind of been doing this internally here for uh, for the recent past is that we've been sticking with that shorter yeah. duration just because we know that by doing that we are not subjecting ourselves to a lot of sensitivity in the bond prices it, because this is sometimes feels like a coin flip like whether we'll have higher interest rates lower interest rate how right. low etc so there is no clarity on that movement and there's no reason for us to subject ourselves to a much higher sensitivity not yeah. knowing so I, I and i just want to be i want to make sure this is super clear for everyone listening when the fed cuts rates it's not like they're cutting the 10 year the 20 year and the 30 year see because you would say michael bavna if there's a 1% decrease, shouldn't I be buying the 10, the 20, or the 30 year? Because the Fed's going to cut rates. So shouldn't we just, hey, the, the Fed cutting rates, it impacts the yield curve mostly down here. This is a supply and demand issue. So you've got the Fed on one side. Yeah, they said they're going to cut rates. But the other hand, we talked about it before in the total level of indebtedness that we have as a country. Could I could easily paint the scenario where people may want to get paid more because of the amount of indebtedness and the amount of implied risk of holding a U.S. bond. And if they want to get paid more, the amount that you can end up losing per interest rate as interest rates, if they were, heaven forbid, were to rise on the longer side, uh, give me the give me the 5% on the one year and, and give me the no risk all day long. Absolutely. Yeah. And we, cuts. We, we've mentioned this okay. so many times throughout the conversation. Gold. gold. All right. Listen, this is for you goldies out there. I know you love gold. So this is for you. This is my long distance dedication to you. Um, uh, and if you really love gold, stop reading those newsletters. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> so it just tends to go hand in hand. Okay. So it, it, look, there are pockets of time. See above this dotted line, there are pockets of time where gold will go up 20%. That happens. Gold, it typically tends to come after times when gold's been hammered. So when gold's been hammered, look at these, you know, bottom points down here. This is, the, this is the rate of change. We're in another pocket where gold's gone up 20%. Okay, great. That's wonderful. That's excellent. But this is, this is not necessarily the kind of 
runaway story that you think, well, now I have to invest in gold. Let's remember, gold does a really wonderful job pricing in fear. And we know that there's fear at a variety of different levels. You can you can look at it in terms of the Middle East conflict or uncertainty with total level of indebtedness. We get that. We get that. Um, but you know, there there's there's definitely part of the story where you know where gold doesn't, you know, we would rather own NVIDIA at the right price than than gold. NVIDIA's got a, a path for long-term growth where you know, gold, gold's never had that kind of long-term trajectory. If you look going back hundreds of years, the price of gold typically goes up by 4% per year. There's a lot of places we can get better. And if you also look, there are times when you, you know, would rather own gold here above the dotted line. There's times we'd rather own silver. Um, interestingly enough, so for those people that really, really love gold, I'm going to go ahead and say maybe this is the time you start to dip your toe into silver, but please don't don't do either. No, call us if you want. Yeah, no. no, and again, I think in the context of you know us, you know the asset looking at asset allocations yeah. and managing client portfolios, yeah. and also navigating through that that fear and greed mm. uh, oscillation that that happens in the market every yeah. now and then. We do acknowledge the fact that gold can be a really good tactical allocation yeah. in the portfolio for brief periods of time, just That's because right. it kind of ends up coinciding with if there's a lot of fear out there about a lot of fundamentals of the global economy, uh, you know, there is a, a little bit of a shift towards wanting to own gold, silver, etc. Mm -hmm. But it can't be a large permanent asset allocation in uh, client portfolios because yeah. of if you look at the longer term average returns from gold as an asset class, it's not it's not at all impressive. Right. Uh, so again, mm -hmm. we can tactically own some of your assets in gold uh, in a very, you know, measured way, but this is not a replacement for long-term investment. No, it's definitely, well, well put. And like I said, where you really want to be buying gold is in these red, red pockets right here, where you don't want to be buying gold is, you know, certainly where we are right now. Um, doesn't mean that it couldn't end up, you know, inching, inching a little bit higher, but um, okay. Get to the next. Okay, so uh, uh, we know that the Chinese central bank's buying a lot of gold. Ta-da! Okay, great, we got it. Oh, this is you. This is me. Yeah. Uh, we're just kind of again. This is uh, this is a staple slide uh, yeah. that we present a lot in all our podcasts, yeah. and this is just you know uh, our internal model of kind of getting a gauge on what to expect from the markets in terms of expected returns yeah. based on where we are right now, both in terms of of pricing and you know just a general indicator of what we expect mm -hmm. from the corporate America in terms of earning growth, et cetera. And without getting into the details and just kind of keeping it high level is there are three different uh, expected forecasts here. One is for the S&P 500 index. Uh, the second is for the S&P 500 index, but on an equal weighted basis. And this goes back to our earlier point of how the market is still pretty unbalanced. And then the third chart here is for the small cap uh, segment of the market. Good, good and you do see a lot more green on the, the small cap index uh, earnings forecast. You do see a lot more on the equal weight as well when compared to the S&P 500. And the reason for that is between the S&P 500 and the equal weight is just goes back to that imbalance. The other 493 companies within the S&P 500 index mm -hmm. have a lot more to catch up on and they're obviously trading at a much lower valuation. So if you're if you have exposure to those, the expected earnings there would be relatively higher uh, versus the S and P five hundred in general, mm -hmm. and the same goes for the S and P uh, you know small cap as well. We've That's talked right. about how again the large cap has just dominated performance over the last twenty so years. But if you go to the next slide, I want to put this into context, especially for the small cap index. Yeah, so just put all of our money in small cap. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, that would be the obvious uh, conclusion from the previous side saying, let's go all in small cap. And yeah. the caveat that I want to throw out there is look at this chart, the percentage of unprofitable companies oh. in an S&P 500 versus a small cap index. And you obviously see that these two are not directly comparable to each other in terms of the levels, which again, intuitively makes sense for, for a lot of small cap companies. Um, there are only a few that actually 
eventually make it big and turn into really profitable businesses. A lot of those are not. So just keep in mind that when we look at the multiples that we would like to assign to an S&P 500 kind of an index, which is a lot more good, good, better quality overall, uh, it would justify um, yeah. a different kind of a multiple versus a small cap. And there's a lot of inherent risk because of the composition of the type of companies. So you would like to command a higher premium mm -hmm. uh, from those that segment of the market. So just keep that in mind when you look back at a lot of green that you saw for the small cap segment of the market in terms of earnings forecast. Yeah, this is a, this is a big percentage of those companies are not profitable. It's wild. Skip it. Uh, the only highlight here is, again, look at a lot of different ways mm -hmm. at looking at the S&P 500's uh, multiples. And the answer almost from every angle comes up as either expensive or very expensive. So mm -hmm. it just I just want to circle back this point to uh, the more recent performance that we've seen in the market. We are trading at really high multiples for the broader market. Yeah. Um, so there a little bit of a realignment there is understandable and it's not something that will concern us a lot about the remainder of the year. We are navigating through the remainder of the year, assuming that there would maybe a little bit of a spike up on that VIX index. The volatility might not continue to stay below average um, and we might see a little bit of that readjustment as the market right. readjusts what it expects the Fed to do going forward. That's right. So in conclusion, so in this this chart for me was I love this one the most. This is it's for me I just I love it the most. So I think it does a really wonderful job of highlighting in blue these bull markets, these bull markets, these long term, uh, still secular. There's still you know cyclical movements in these secular bull markets. Um, but you know 20, 26 months or 150 months or 133 months or where we are now is at 18 months where, yeah, um, this is why we invest. We invest because there are long times where U U.S. corporations can uh, find ways to grow, to deliver more profits for their shareholders, um, innovate, you know, whether it be product or the way that they do things or become more productive. This is, this is why we invest. And yeah, there are pockets of time where it, whether it be things are, massively overvalued and have to get course corrected, or there's uh, economic surprises that we didn't know were gonna happen and they happen. And that's here in this um, red? No, well, I don't know what color that is. It's almost like a like a Let's bad sunburn. Red. 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 Uh, yeah, that, so there are pockets of time where the market can be down, but look at in just in terms of, this does a really good job of the, the sca multi-decade scale of it. Um, so by no means is this market rally that we've seen, this doesn't spell that we're done. It just is, is indicative of the fact of that, yeah, this is this could be one of those pockets. It would be one of the smaller growth pockets that we've had. But absent of a surprise, you know, there's so much that's going on with the stock market um, and with valuations and with, you know, different economic data set that gives us an indication that you know, things aren't all that bad. Yes, we've got a geopolitical risk that remains high. Um, it seems like the conflict in the Middle East is uh, improving with respect to Iran and Israel's tensions here at the moment. So uh, I want to acknowledge the fact that if that were to change, and if it were start to look like there's some version of World War III that we do get dragged into, if that does happen, that is going to fundamentally change not just our expectations of earnings, but a variety of them. So um, we are watching the geopolitical tensions. We uh, we will end up considering um, doing something that's aggressively, uh, uh, again, aggressively different. Uh, interest rate cuts may not be as smooth as we would like. We talked about that. Um, again, we preach balance and diversification always. This is no different. Um, again, the, the, the stocks that are outside of technology, to me, appear very uh, reasonably priced, which is great. So you, you, you'll you see some equal weight if you already haven't seen it in your portfolios. Those are the kind of things that we're always looking to continue to introduce, reasonable valuation. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, we're going to have to wait and see exactly what the Fed does to, to determine whether or not that's going to change some of the dynamics for businesses and borrowing. I got some disclosures. I got a thank you slide. And this one, oh. th this time around is even more pertinent because everyone was just so patient with us mm -hmm. while we were trying to figure out the tech issues. So thank mm. you, everyone, for hanging in there. The whole building went, I mean, <laughs> like, I don't understand. What were the odds of that happening while we were live? So but there you are, makes this, like I said, makes this memorable. Yes. <laughs> so by the way, the editors are going to have a blast, like cutting and pasting those two suckers together. Um, so do and thank you. There were several qu questions that were emailed in. We think we answered them all. Um, if there's things that you want to know more about, if there's things that we didn't address or address deep enough, I couldn't imagine what it would be, but, but, but let us know. We're happy to, to take you through it. And, uh, if you'd like to share this market outlook, we are going to, as always, we'll package it. We'll put it on YouTube. We'll email it out to you and feel free to share it as you see fit. On that note. You got I know you got a meeting. I know you got a meeting. I know. All right. Thank you again. Take care. Have a wonderful Bye. day. Bye.